<laughs> welcome, welcome everybody to this uh, beautiful evening. It's so good to see such a great crowd out and about for some reading, some music. How are you feeling about this? So good. You're feeling really so good. good. Yeah, really, really good. I'm so glad. <laughs> So I'm Jennifer Siner. I teach creative nonfiction um, at Utah State, and I've had the great good fortune of having Nate in several classes, as many of us have, and it is a real honor to be able to introduce him tonight. Before that, I want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events. There is a creative writing class being offered by Adam Fagan, who is a poet, and it begins on March 11th. So there is a flyer if you're interested. It's a six-week class, and it meets on Wednesdays. And then we also want to let you know that the next Telecom West, which is after spring break, is on Thursday, March 12th, and Amber, Karen, and Natalie Rogers, who are both fiction writers, will be reading at that event. So that will be really wonderful, and I hope you guys can come. As always, we want to thank the Logan Library for hosting us and allowing us to be in this space, um, to Kat and to Joseph um, at the library, to Star for all the work that she does relentlessly, freely and with grace to bring Helicon West to us at least twice a month, sometimes even more. Also to Cafe Ibis for their support. Did I forget anybody start? All right. It is my great pleasure tonight to introduce one who needs no introduction, <laughs> Nate Hardy. <laughs> is uh, soon to be released, a writer who has published in Sincalo, Mangrove Journal, and Cathexis, and a community organizer mm -hmm. who organizes people not around political action, but around art. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nate has been... <laughs> Nate has been a vibrant part of the Logan community, as well as a lodestar within the English department for the past and I'm saying five, but Nate, you can correct me. Is it five years? It's five. Yeah, it's five. Five years. I know Nate best as a writer. And I can say I know him best as a writer because he is a witness to the world. Mm -hmm. A witness who never looks away. Whether writing poetry or prose, Nate lays down lines that cast no shadow. Mm -hmm give neither reader or writer a place to hide. They are raw words, honest words, and they are shot through by a beauty bright fierceness. Mm -hmm. Are you listening, Nate asks in his song, Broken Boy, this is me learning to be free. Are you listening, he asks us time and again, because when we truly attend, when we invite our entire selves into our own lives, then, he writes, and only then, we will forget how to look and remember how to see. Mm -hmm. It is with a full heart mm -hmm. that I introduce Nate to all of you tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I hire you to write my Tinder profile? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll think about it, Matula. I'll think about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, wow, it is just a blessing and a half to have uh, this many uh, of my close friends and uh, family members here tonight. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I've, I've been anticipating it a lot. Uh, and we've got this, this awesome project that we got off the ground by like the skin of our teeth and three miracles, at least, no more than, no less than three miracles. Uh, but to get started, I wanted to ask, uh, has anyone here ever eaten a wasabi pea? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, um, uh, Smith's a couple years ago added wasabi peas to their bulk section, and I totally, I went berserk. I ate wasabi <laughs> uh, But uh, the thing about a wasabi pea is you can't uh, eat it and be focused on anything else because it's a, it's a painful food. Um, 
And so, uh, it, uh, this, is, this is a poem called Wasabi P, and it's subtitled Satori. And a Satori is a sudden, abrupt enlightenment. Um, so, such is the experience of eating one of them, and I, I hope such is the experience of this poem. Light, shh. Light, pop! Like, bop to bat bat, little ball of big band jazz. Bold, green and gold, rolled in Dijon and olive oil. Fire powder and arrowroot flour. Don't spit it, the split minute. Death clapped, breath snatched. It's the bite that bites back. Oh, snap. Hey, mommy, wasabi mommy. Mad horseradish from Japan. Furnace face dragon snack. Lungs flapping in the aftermath. Inverse, whoo, why, 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 why? No time, never, never mind. Tongue licked by the sulfur whip, brimstone breath, can't not give a shit, can't give it back. Right now is where it's at. Yes! Uh, they're, they're not a snack to be trifled with. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I've been running slam, uh, slam events for five years now, and uh, I would prefer it if you guys made noise when you liked the noises that I make. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, and that's a pretentious um, uh, request, then I don't, I don't care. Uh, uh, but be before we really get rolling, I, I want uh, the Young West. Um, Logan, uh, for those of you here, you have an idea. But if you haven't been in the scene, then you don't really know that this is an incredible art town. It's like a little hub of creativity, and there's a heartbeat in this town. Yeah, Star knows it. <laughs> she totally knows it. Yeah. Um, and there's tons of venues to share like this one. But uh, we, we needed something that like, really anthologized it on a, on a semi-regular basis and could get everyone. And so we started the Young West, and it's just a literary zine. Um, and I'll tell you more about it in a while, but that's, uh, that is the, uh, the explanation to the, uh, the ambiguous but nice title here. <laughs> uh, anyway, if y'all have ever, do you like trees? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chase, I know you like trees. Uh, they're like our lungs outside of our lungs. Um, mm -hmm. Our lungs is lungs, and if you really think about them, it's like, whoa. Uh, uh, so th this is called the tree in motion. Uh, like a bomb dropped in a blink into the soil. The thing goes off over the course of lifetimes. I imagine you must watch the greatest forests, the Amazon, the aspen groves rise, like firework displays or wars in reverse. Mm. Each blast a celebration of independence from nothing, the soil boils, of love like a current of gentle electricity, mm. synaptic perhaps, as you remember a 10-acre banyan sweating in the breath of prehistoric Bangalore, an oak, initials in a pierced heart taking shape in the flying bark, a willow weeping like Christ, mm. or a sapling tasting the oil of my hand as I vanish in the silence of its blast. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I listened to this guy named Sadhguru on YouTube, and, uh, and he, he was a, uh, in an American literature class, and uh, when the teacher started talking about uh, Robert Frost, they said, uh, into the woods, lovely, dark and deep, and he said, hold up, shut up. I'm not listening to any man who calls uh, the wilderness wood. <laughs> uh, this next one's called The Persistence of Memory, an ode to driving through Idaho, and if you've ever driven through Idaho, you know it's awful. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, push it, poet. <laughs> uh, uh, so anything you can do to pass the time is, is worth it, and so uh, this is a poem. Um, and The Persistence of Memory is, of course, the Salvador Dali, it's the piece with the melting clocks. Um, so, were Dali a country boy, he would have watched these buttes take shape from the ground and stop time. As though rising from the synaptic fabric of God's tangible imagination. As to us, it seemed that the ground moved through time as water moves through space. The highway, a memory we had yet to have. Um, and will you go to the sponsors page real quick? So, um, the, uh, Logan is just a freaking goldmine of work to be, you know, presented. Uh, and it's a goldmine of people who give a shit about it. Uh, but as with any artistic endeavor, uh, it is impossible to find funding. Uh, not impossible, it's just tough. 
And so uh, <laughs> the issue with, with getting this guy off the ground was, was uh, finding funding. And so I had to go around and get told no. Uh, by I don't know how many businesses until we finally got the support of Transcend Yoga, Cafe Ibis, and then um, Rex, Ryan, and Karen with Golden Copper. And I wanted to say something about uh, these guys real quick. Uh, they have got three going on. How many books? 37. Oh. <laughs> well, so a lifetime endeavor ahead of them. But uh, my buddy Jack Byland and I have helped them edit these three books. And uh, you guys can buy them, just talk to them. They're gold and copper. And uh, Rex did one of the sweetest things. He came up to me and handed me a $100 bill and said, take your magazine off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So just they're, they're... Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Seth. <laughs> they, uh, they're all the way out by Sardine Canyon, but they're a really important part of the community. Um, and uh, they're, well, well uh, we'll save that announcement for a little later. Uh, so check these out if you get the chance. They, uh, they asked me to write a couple poems for one of their books, and so this is a poem going in their upcoming book, Golden Sapphire. It's called Endless Gold. I'll find you in the cold, where dark is not and light is still caught in tender frost. I'll find you alone, beneath the sun's hollow fall, where in ephemeral ice all and nothing are lost. You and I, a trick of the eye, Two threads of the wick that conducts the golden fire, heaven's point to hell's spire, a trick of the mind, an eternity in time, this ancient blindness of the soul, that we are anything but endless gold. Mm -hmm. Oh, and if you see these pages, uh, so, uh, Anne Schill, will you just raise your hand? Yeah. And stand up We were, we were just talking earlier, if there's two people in history that have reached their cap for coolness, like just the, the threshold of coolness, first one's Jimi Hendrix, second one's Ann Schill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when we were trying to get this magazine off the ground, I gave her all the work and she designed this in two days. Mm. So. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for this next one, but I hope that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Way back, I mean way, 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 way back, so far it's forward. In fact, so far forward it's back, before the beginning of beginningless time, after the end of endless time, in a land written in paradoxes, there sat around a bonfire the gods of the present day. There was Christ and a few of his disciples, and it was a bring-your-own-alcohol sort of thing. So, <laughs> Jesus brought an IV and Judas brought IPA. <laughs> The Buddha and a couple of holy bodhisattvas were there, and they'd forgotten lawn chairs, so they just sat cross-legged and thought about how much it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> how empty it all felt, but how deeply worth it. <laughs> a couple cats from the Hindu pantheon, namely Vishnu, who is feeling happy but looking blue. <laughs> really, that's the cheapest line of this whole thing. <laughs> Uh, Krishna playing on a flute and Ganesh who brought the peace pipe in the Hindu Kush. I correct myself, that's the cheapest line. Uh, and started talking about how all things are just the, the same, just wearing different bodies. Mohammed and Zoroaster came and even Eminem was there to represent where I allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> they decided against inviting the flying spaghetti monster because he was a condescending prick and L. Ron Hubbard was an entrepreneurial dick and Kanye only <laughs> talked about himself. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Joseph Smith was busy checking his hat for an invite, but feeling more like Charlie Brown on Halloween, saying, I got a rock. <laughs> now, you were raised Mormon if you got that. Uh, <laughs> but the capital T truth is, <laughs> the capital T truth is, we were all there, y'all. Then our host, the Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, and everything in between, the nameless, the form that is emptiness, emptiness that is formed, the right now, who had been quiet, stood forth and said, y'all want to hear a wild story? Mm -hmm. And at that precise moment, a log snapped in the fire with a big bang and sent a mighty swath of sparks into the primordial sky that twisted into his voice and became the cosmos. And this, right here, right now, this is the part of the poem where I stopped talking and started listening to the wildest story anyone ever told. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, so this next one actually, uh, 
Uh, this is, I wrote this after Charles Waugh told me a story. Uh, you probably don't even remember it. We were standing in the English building. He told me a story about, uh, I think, a night in Dublin when, uh, when there, it was a packed bar room. Some, a girl got up and just sang. Uh, and uh, it, it was reminiscent of a, a similar uh, event I'd had in, in Kansas City. So this is called Sober. Um, Today a memory snared me. It became more than the moment at hand, more present than past. It was a bar room packed dark with abandoned bodies, warm with liquor and its sister joy. A riot of vibrations played thick the air, a pub band reeked noise from the corner stage, and it sounded like being beneath breaking waves. Beneath breaking waves, the electricity of that Midwest midnight tapestried across so many synapses, struck ground when the players stopped, and a girl with her body alone began to sing. Mm. And every spirit-soaked voice remembered the same sound at the same time, and there shook only the chords of the deathless in us. And gravity lifted, and we all surfaced at once, and we were all young. Mm. Um, so this next one, uh, I, I grew up playing the banjo, and if you ask half of the people, uh, they would say banjo sucks. <laughs> anyway, it's called blue. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, I love the banjo. Mitch and I were just talking about the banjo earlier. In fact, the lowest point to Mitch's day was not being able to play the banjo before he came here, um, which was just the was just sweet as hell. Um, uh, so this is called bluegrass. Um, there's not a lot to do in Kansas, uh, I guess, except banjo. <laughs> and drugs. Uh, bluegrass. Where'd you go, sweet song? You summer thrum that played my boyhood like a banjo string. Hot as cicadas rattling in backyard locust trees. Shaking the air awake. Ancient drone narrate me. A blacktop mirage. Where'd you go, old call, you prairie breath, filling the jug of Midwest midnight hollow, rising on the wind, pulling across a thousand dry acres of sweet corn, out of the silence trembling over the west, into the front porch, where the sea glass wind chimes played back that same homesick song, and Mama sat still in the old swing, listening and thinking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I missed you before you left. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, for those of you who know me, you know I'm a sucker for a good haiku. Uh, <laughs> I really love haiku. Jack Kerouac called them pops. Um, and uh, they're just a really great like sketch, like a non-judgmental sketch of something happening. And uh, these are some transitional haikus because I'm going to start reading some heavier things. Um, so uh, here's to transitional haiku. Um, On cold wind, the willow breathes away its leaves. Through library windows, Snow grows on bare branches, quiet as time. Suicide. I killed the man that killed me. To look back, look back, salt runs in Lot's tears. Um, so uh, this next one, can you all uh, cut the, uh, the cameras off for this one? Uh, see. All right, I just have a couple more here. Uh, the next one I want to read just because it's a... Not an answer, but it's the closest thing to an existential lozenge I've ever found. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's called Love People. A lot of y'all might have heard it before. You can find it uh, if you go to um, at Soul Hardy Music. You can find it on YouTube. So uh, it's called Love People. Mm. I want to love people. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say I want to love people, I mean I want to love them like a place in every street lamp with a stained glass bowl just for the hell of it. Mm. Because it's beautiful. Like you and like me. I mean, I want to love people like making the nicest girl in the room laugh. Like the voice my grandfather uses to read the gospel, like a mirror with an off switch. I want to love people like the person I am just forgot about the person I just want to be and the person I just wanted to be dissolved in the person I am. I want to love people like that. I want to love people like folding the blue sky into a bouquet of seven billion origami roses and giving them to everybody with notes that read, look, there's only seven billion of us here and you get to be one. Like today, our mouths are for kissing and nothing else. I want to love people like John Lennon's imagination, like Gandhi's conviction, like a Christian that actually listens. 
So when I say I want to love people, I mean I want to love them like the, con the congregations of every church, mosque, synagogue, and temple in the world doing a Chinese fire drill with one another all at once. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to love people like making all the bullets currency so no one would waste them killing anybody anymore and making all the currency go fuck yourself tickets so we could tell all the banks and crooked politicians exactly what's on everyone's mind. I want to love people like the way a child's eyes touch what's in front of them. Like we all forgot where to look and remembered how to see. Like we all forgot how to speak and remembered what to say. I want to love people like instead of handing children only a word and definition to use when teaching them of forgiveness, we would show their gentle eyes simply to point upwards at the moon and stars and keep their mouths shut. Mm -hmm. I want to love people like my mother believes in them, like I so badly wish that I could. I want to love people like my cousin loved heroin. Like the day he woke up alone with no more fuck yourself tickets to spend and a hand loaded with currency that all went to his head in a flash that power like he's richer than any of us ever have been now believe me I want to love people like I want him back. Mm -hmm. So when I say I want to love people I mean I want to love people y'all. Like seven billion people pointing up at the moon and stars with their mouths shut, mm. clutching blue roses against their hearts so that when the day gives each of us its light, we can celebrate by letting go our unfolding arms into the sky as we watch it erupt into the color of a baptism. Whoa. Yeah. How y'all feeling? Are you getting that vertigo you get from listening to so many... Oh, I'm like, feeling good. There's like a really nice change of pace right now. So, uh, uh, yeah, thanks again so much for coming tonight. It really means a lot. It's, it's exciting for me. So, uh, let's see. This next one's called The 88. Um, and this is about a, a kid whose mom is trying to force him to play the violin, but he just loves the blues too much. <laughs> so he can't do it. School's out means two things. One summer's in, two lessons on the strings. Mom's decree, post-equinox, days of terriers, not a jam rock Stratocaster, more like Stradivarius for Walt to carry past the no good neighborhood kids like a tombstone or a kick me sign. At least it's not a goddamn clarinet. <laughs> Am I right? Wrong. The kid draws a bow like fingernails along a chalkboard. Bored out his wits, truth is, he'd rather swallow rosin than practice the violin. And watch other kids through his window hold invisible fiddles and play them with their middle fingers for kicks and giggles. Besides, he hates the classics. He likes the blues, the ragtime, the jazzers, the bad men, the out of hell they came cold with hands to translate soul. Baked and bold, take the pain and make it gold. Stank face soul. Yeah. But yo, your mom wants to raise him proper. So she got him propped up on, on, on Bach, Chopin, and Shostakovich, hoping he'll turn out a young magnum opus, Lil Vivaldi with a bowl cut, show that Mrs. Smith down the street up, what can her kid do? Kick a goal, what? Where's the class and style? So she hatches a plan to invite him over for dinner and have a recital. Meanwhile, in the basement, Walt's lifting the lid on an upright crate that bears dust on a black and white 88. And legend it belonged to his late great left the fam to chase the fame granddad who could rip a Steinway with vision. Rumor yeah. has it he was hired to play at exorcisms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he could show the devil up, but mom hates his guts, rolling stones, such and such. So when Walt struck the middle C, like a match to kerosene, like a mob to heresy, mom has flashbacks to therapy and declares that he never touched the piano again. Oh, she didn't. She did, she did, she did, she did, she did. She did. Now, Summer's in full swing. Dinner scheduled two weeks. Practice schedule at its peak. How many hours a day? Three. Three? To iron out the squeaks and hide the growing irony between son and mom and dearly deceased. <laughs> but there ain't no shades of gray between them black and white keys. Matter of fact, there ain't no way that fate's turning back on its schemes. So every second mom's out the house, Walt's at the hound's mouth, plunking out the sounds of angels who learn to get down when they hit the ground. Yeah. Knows he shouldn't, but boogie woogie, no goody ever understood. He could put the put up in the pudding so goodly. I mean, looky looky at what the cookie rookie playing hooky is cooking up. Yeah, yeah. It's madness, beautiful, batshit, crazy, bad is bad, can bad kids, that is, until he hears the minivan pulling in and has to wrap his hands back around the violin, so his yeah. mom waltzes in smiling, thinking, my, my, look at my kid. Bitch, she's <laughs> dialing the whole neighborhood and telling them to save the dinner date for brats and lemonade and perhaps a little serenade from her little chair of silken strings. Oh, she did it. 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 So, 
The covert soul burner stays incognito to avoid a scene akin to Tarantino till the day of the big concertino when he's standing between his mom and a mirror, getting his mop comb to the ears and it hits him like a shot of Everclear. He sucks at violin worse than sorority chicks suck at drinking beer. <laughs> But before he can warn mom of the impending fire, the first guests are beginning to arrive and she's whisked to the kitchen to show off her collection of fine china. My, my, his time has come and passed. The die is cast. He might as well write a will to give his Legos to charity and his violin to the trash. <laughs> or perhaps he spikes the punch with anthrax and leaves the country with snacks in his backpack. Wait, that's whack. No good. Soon the whole house is holding the whole hood. Gulp, could things get any worse? Yes. <laughs> Cutie pigtails from down the street is standing next to the Smith kid in cleats. Somebody call the hearse. Then everybody's gathered in the backyard like a murder of crows, ready to laugh hard, and mom's stoking the flames. When a filament starts glowing like hope in his brain, she says, Wally, grab the violin and tell our guests to get ready for why they came. <laughs> so he ducks inside, skips the music room, and heads for the basement, blows the dust off the sides of his fate, and wheels the piano onto the patio stage. When his mom sees the keys, she nearly faints. She feels an aneurysm forming in her brain, but then he starts to play and the jaws fall. Oh my goodness, y'all, it's like the second coming of Ray Charles. Everybody, everybody gets down, everybody gets the sound. It ain't language, it's deeper, it's beat. It's the beat to keep, it's the beat of the heart being beaten and down and even his mom yeah, can see yeah, it yeah. and even she starts to cut a rug burn a foot rattle her skeleton <laughs> shake the dust all night long everybody shakes the dust i said all night long we all shake the dust oh he didn't he did he didn't he did he didn't he did <laughs> Thanks again so much for coming, y'all. I've got just two more, uh, and one of them's a rap. Uh, so, um, so I've been writing hip hop for five years now with uh, Donnie. Donnie, will you raise your hand? It's gonna be our third album. Uh, but, uh, Donnie, how many albums is that for you, my friend? Uh, thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thirteen. Uh, Donnie, Donnie's an incredible musician. He's been arguably one of the best things for my artistic development. Just a great guy. You can find his music uh, at Donovan Colton Music. Uh, that's the Instagram, and then look up, what would you look up to find it, like, uh, it's anywhere, just Donovan Cole, Donovan Cole Music, uh, uh, shameless plug, he's incredible, uh, and, uh, we're heading down to LA in August to jump around in that city's teeth and, uh, yeah. just well, make a living doing that. Uh, so this, uh, this next one's called Sympathy for the Reaper, um, and, uh, it's a conversation between the angel of death and an old woman who's on her deathbed. The first two verses are the angel of death basically having an existential crisis, which is the most existential thing I could think of. <laughs> um, and the last verse is, is the woman's response, but at the time I was writing the song, the poet Mary Oliver died, and uh, she's been a longtime favorite of mine, and so inadvertently, the woman in the, in the rap uh, in my mind is, is Mary Oliver. So I wanted to lead into the, poem with the, uh, into the rap with the poem Wild Geese. Oh, so yeah. this is one of my favorite poems, and if you haven't heard it, I'm just gonna go ahead and say you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> it's incredible, so. Uh, wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clear blue air, are heading home again. Mm. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, anyway, yeah, the, uh, now for the, for the rap. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys, you guys feeling good? You're not like... Feeling so good. <laughs> good. Gravy pain. Yeah, there, there's something about listening to yourself talk for 30 minutes that's uh, flattering and scary. Uh, so let's see. Can y'all hear that well enough? Okay. So we had our friend Ryan do the, uh, uh, do the, the vocals on it. He's a metal musician, just killer. So uh, there is a point in the chorus 
where there's a scream. And I do not scream, but Ryan does. So uh, you'll hear that on um, the speaker, just to uh, prep you. Also, can we turn the, uh, the, the, the cameras off? Uh, I had a friend in high school named Nico Papazaferopoulos, and his name Whoa. is a, a similar mouthful. Uh, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so that's that's on our uh, our upcoming album. It's going to come out in the next couple months. It's going to be called. Um, oh wait, I can't say that yet, can I? So that's that's. <laughs> can I say that? Sure. Oh yeah, uh, Saturday with a it's S A B. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, so so be looking for that. Yeah, we've been working hard on that, and uh, and uh, I've got a great uh, story about the Taipan Trading Outlet if you want to hear it. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going to read my last piece now. Again, thanks so much for coming out, guys. It really means a lot uh, mm -hmm. to support the scene and uh, to, to be from this just kind of soil of people. It's, it's really awesome. It's really awesome. Uh, so this is called Stanzas for Logan. Um, and uh, I, one of my favorite writing exercises is to just catch the people uh, that are close to me in these little um, blurbs of gratitude. Uh, and so these are my favorite stanzas, not to be confused with my favorite people, because that would give me a lot of trouble. So uh, <laughs> these are just a few of my, my favorite stanzas from that exercise. So it's called uh, Stanzas for Logan, and the last one is for Logan itself. Um, so, Jordan uh, Okada, my first friend in Utah. You can measure Miller High Life in 40-ounce bottles, but you can't measure the real value of a fake ID. <laughs> or how fast we ran from those red and blue lights or cardboard dick silhouettes in the dorm elevators, <laughs> or five years of stumbling back to college with that big blue A as our beacon, whether it stands for angels or assholes, I don't know. <laughs> but I'd be fine with both. <laughs> Star Cobra. Mm. I should... <laughs> That's how you know Star is. <laughs> you say her name and people are like, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, Star Cobra. I shouldn't need to say much more than your name. Mm. You're a center of gravity, yeah. a source of endless light for this scene. You are warmth that raises forests in the heart. To be in your orbit is to be closer to absolute love and poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Justin Smith, <laughs> you absolute buffoon. <laughs> <laughs> you see the world through Rubik's tubes and Labradoodles. You can climb, climb rocks like Lady could sing the blues. And your heart shines like those old lanterns with a nice spread. <laughs> Chase Canal. Listen here, handsome. <laughs> this town is and has always been big enough for both our yellow assets. You just keep fighting for our mama, yeah? I'll see you on the endless flip side of this ridiculous accent. Uh, Jordan Forrest. Girl, the way you think is the way a cello sounds. Endless curve of a question mark. I am not surprised to find that the cello plays closest and registered to the human voice, so keep speaking. You are music, you are medicine. Rex and Carrie. Y'all caught youth by the tail, told it sit and it sat, spit and it spat out three going on five novels in a Netflix contract. Curiosity is a giant and you were riding its shoulders looking, always looking. And Shil, yeah. you are a bolt. Mm. An aurora borealis meets lightning, meets a quiet cup of coffee on an endless morning. Whenever you speak, it is an improvement on silence. Mm. Whatever you see shows the shades of God inside of you. Yeah. Nikhil and Nikhil, <laughs> you dangy lunges. <laughs> you can cook the soul and laugh a laugh that gives time a run for its money. You understand the word family like most understand the word oxygen. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, here we go. Uh, Mehdi Shafi, <laughs> doctor, doctor. <laughs> what trick did the gods play on themselves when they made you? Mm. <laughs> You wild-hearted bastard, you jazz chef, you walking shadow of Rumi and Aldous Huxley, death will come. <laughs> death will come. But right now it runs from you like a rabbit at the crack of a gun, like night runs from dawn. Oscar Cambona, God is good. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> Louder, Oscar. <laughs> Listen, Dr. Paul Crumbly. Old beat Buddha of Swenson and Dickinson's Bodhisattva, you can play out a book of poetry like Hendrix could play a guitar. Mm -hmm. Had youth found you and I side by side, we'd have raised Cain. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. May Swenson, are you here? <laughs> oh, oh, well, oh, so there's May Swenson, and then there's May Swenson. Oh, I should have written one for May Swenson. Actually, no, she's got a. Write one for Swenson, yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, so this is for a good friend of mine named May. She sings like just no one's got any business. Wow. Um, so May Swainston. In this slanted shaft of light, we are dust motes drifting out of one wall of shadow and into the next. 
But sometimes there is a piano playing softly in the sound of your voice. Mm. As I drift through this one shaft of light, in those moments I believe we will never die. Travis Stoneman. Some say there are men that happen to have big hearts, but you, my bearded friend, are a big heart that happens to have a man. <laughs> Don. I've doubted a lot of things. Myself, my religion, my government, duh. <laughs> my existence, my God, but I do not doubt you. Because you were alive, more of the infinite borealis of music shines. Because you were my friend, I have seen where those lights touch earth and believed in them. Mm -hmm. And then last but, uh, last but not least, y'all, um, we uh, are releasing our, our little magazine to the public and they're for sale for $5 via cash or Venmo right on the back table. And uh, it's just, this is going to be a seminal little thing or a pivotal little thing in the, in the Logan Lit scene. So definitely pick one up. And uh, this is the uh, little editor's note and it is the stanza for Logan. So dear Logan. Yeah. You smoky old thing. <laughs> you melting pot of guilty libido and existential angst. <laughs> you iron barred winter and sweltering mouth of summer heat. I wouldn't be surprised if your police busted an underground sex education ring. <laughs> In the shadow of the temple or the big A or in the heartbeat of Y sound in Ibis at the not so ironic intersection of Federal and Church Street. <laughs> Still, you were the fabric of our memory, laid bare before the Wellsvilles to witness them swallow the sun and split the stars open every night. You were the thrum of our traffic and the meditation on our canyon's ancient breath. You were Swenson's womb, an eclectic muse of hipsters and academics, burnouts and blue-collar beauties, urban wild, apple plum and pear trees, grapevines swollen to chain-link fences, 100-year-old homes and tender ghosts, little river, rural veins, skyward shattering pines, the smell of willow and poplar and box elder leaves dancing beneath an asphalt mirage or desert rain. You were the timeless midnight light of diners and laundromats, the one with the Budasaro sunflower out back. You were the mahogany drops of buckeyes gazing up from the street. You were the airborne sneaker swinging from electric wire like a compass needle to our beat. Little big city below the crest, little poetry capital of the West. Yeah, baby. Georgia a little while ago and I got super bored on the airplane 
So I figured, why not write some poems? <laughs> um, so I watched my friend Preston fold paper crane themes for the duration of the flight, and this is the poem that re resulted from that. It's called Airplane Crane. Um, I sit in the terminal, gazing at the rubber-scratched tarmac. Beside me, Preston folds origami cranes with spare notebook paper. We board the plane, and he gently places a crane in the palms of the pilot. His yoke calloused hands cup the paper bird. We take our seats, 9B and 9C, our knees bundle between blue leather seat backs and the plane lifts into the atmosphere. Stale air hums through the cabin and I watch him fold paper into cranes. Meanwhile, I crunch on complimentary cookies. Mm. Biscoff, of course. <laughs> At the end of the flight, I notice his glasses glint in a thin slice of sunlight fractured through the oval pane. I watch him raise the crane up toward the wispy clouds as the tires touch down on the ground with a screeching rubber thud. Mm. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Nate Hardy is the type of guy to write a six second poem and I think about it for the rest of my life. <laughs> Dude, I, I want to write a collection of poetry and just give it to him just so we can have the honor of being graced with that flow. This dude, <laughs> my gosh, I just I can't say enough good things about this guy. So happy for him that we all got to hear his great reading. Um, my name's Donnie, not the other Donnie, I'm sure you're awesome. I should have just like left and let you perform. <laughs> uh, but this is a poem I wrote and it's called The Dinosaur Book. Growing up, my older sister was me. You know it's true, she used to steal my G.I. Joes and turn them into Ken dolls. She would stealthily sneak down the hall and confiscate my soldiers of valor while I slept. When I woke, I was willfully ready to send these men into missions meant for the brave and the free, but they were otherwise occupied serving Barbie her tea. <laughs> when my mother assumed her role as judge and reviewed the case, my sister went at budge from the position that she had apparently tarnished the honor of my Joes out of compassions. Her actions were innocent. I wasn't that ignorant, no, she was the devil. <laughs> my sister taught me how to read. And believe me, that sounds great, but it's not. She, she would fiendishly plot to assert her dominance, forcing me to start from the very beginning of the dinosaur book every time I made a mistake. Even as I recite this rhyme, I cannot remember how many times it took me to correctly say pterodactyl. <laughs> my sister was danger. She was 10% ponytail and 90% anger. <laughs> she was trained to curve her cute little lips into a grin that could begin to fool you into believing she wasn't planning world domination, but I knew. <laughs> I knew exactly who she was until the only thing I knew was that she was no longer here. Mm -hmm. I remember clearly the days in which the words broke and heaven became synonymous. I remember the bus ride home from the first day of school without her. I gathered the news the best way a six-year-old knows how by not understanding not understanding why my heart felt heavy at the mention of pterodactyls. Mm -hmm. Why I suddenly found myself wishing my G.I. Joes would once again perform their vanishing act. I watched as a single mother attacked herself with the burden of grief she could have never been ready to bear. Her hair seemed to turn gray and wither away the moment she felt the impact of absence. I was a boy, and I had a front row seat to the show that depicted my life changing forever. Immediately after weathering the first act in shock, I wanted to refund I wanted to fund the theater that had put on this horror flick. I wanted everything to click to normal so I could have my sister back. I stacked regret upon apology, hoping it would be enough to lure her, to return to our recurring and act of quarreling, qual to return to our recurring act of quarreling kids, only to see stationary G.I. Joes and an empty stage. Even though my age had prevented me from feeling the full weight of loss, even though I couldn't process everything unraveling before me, I knew I missed her. My mean sister, who was trying to teach me Barbie was lonely and Joe needed a break. My strict reading teacher, who made me correct my mistakes because education is important and it is a struggle and it is worth every attempt. I still miss her. I still think sometimes about what her life might be like now. I think about how we were both on the same motorcycle that day. We both endured the cascading metal crumpling into pavement, but I'm still here. And she went away. I can't really say that it's survivor's guilt because I don't know if I was ever selfless enough to wish that it had been me, just that it hadn't been her. 
Our driver broke his leg. I escaped with road rash and a minor bruising. And my mean sister cruised into an early exit from a life she loved. A life with simultaneous stakes and innocence and world domination. A life in which no pl playground frustration was ever enough to prevent her from coming home and reading to her boisterous little brother. My faith in an eternal father tells me I'll see her again, but no when will ever be soon enough for me to see her and tell her six very important words. Thank you. I love you. Pterodactyl. <laughs> I, I do not mean to lace these words with contempt or to haunt myself with regret for not appreciating what I had because I was a little boy. And little boys are silly, but do we really ever realize the love someone brings into our life? What someone means to us until they become someone that exists in memory? Do we routinely revisit the pages of a book that was never finished, wondering if we too critical of a single chapter? Perhaps it is only after that we see that they only ever had as many thorns as we did. At times, we will fail to grasp just how much light someone brings to the dark nights of our existence. Even with faithful resistance, we will find ourselves at times held captive by captivating question of what if, as you think who we may have missed out on. Despite this, we must remember that our perception will fail to reconstruct another's reflection, that it will only ever be as perfect as we are, and I'm sorry to say we're just not. But I pray that above all, we will not show resistance in loving as fiercely as we can those we hold dear, especially our mean sisters. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nate is awesome. Uh, I have two poems uh, for today, tonight. Uh, they're they're uh, pretty, pretty new, so might be a bit rocky. Uh, first one uh, is about uh, my family and I's first trip to Oregon, which is a beautiful place if you're from uh, Utah like I am. <laughs> right. so this is called Meals Along Highway 101. We have eaten deer and beef and antelope all our lives. By the ocean, we eat clam chowder, a whole Dungeness crab served to go in a box like a pizza. At each place we go, I consume a plate of shellfish and pasta increasing in price and decreasing in quality. <laughs> the first at a restaurant two streets over from the hotel, through a people-crowded maze of white paint porches and wooden blue ship's sails on hanging signs, after a smiling white beard sea captain type smiled at us in the waiting area from his spot as 16th in line to be served. The second in a hotel above a geese-speckled river in blue sunset ending in a green drizzled cheesecake that my sister ended up hating. <laughs> of clams pried open with the tines of the fork, their gooey discs pried free from the last small foothold and eaten like a booger. <laughs> the third was only mom, drained in marinara, eaten on a red rust rooftop, viewing triangles of pine trees above the edge of the railing. Its price kept a secret from sis and dad back in the room, justification of graduation the summer before. And the final meal on a crescent beach in California, advertised as a shrimp and grilled cheese sandwich, geisha canned gray sand granules in Velveeta, and from my sister's plate, the very best french fries we have ever had. <laughs> I also like um, writing poems about my dreams that I have, dream images, because I feel that there's something, you know, truly artistic that also, uh, you know, come uh, from from my experience. I, th I think both of those are important. All right, so this is uh, one of the earliest, most said images. It is called uh, Immeasurable House. I recall the outside as large, rectangular, blankly ominous, more a hospital or school than a house, I think brought from remembrances of the odd painted perspective 
of the building for the doctor's office on Courage the Cowardly Dog from an episode I can no longer find. In the dream memory it looms large and appears darkened, only sky around, the sides of where it sits on a small inclined green hill, stone stairs, an exploding white sunset splaying light from behind, creating an unseeable distance. Wide lines of elongated dark siding running along repeating windows of square orange light. There always stands a crowd of people unseen, but heard and felt behind me as I enter, standing in a gathering beneath that green hill gray twilight, themselves as hazy as the mute horizon, chatting in great disquiet, as if deeply concerned at the prospect of being faceless dream phantoms, no body to speak of, trapped in repeat within luminal space. As their murmuring continues like static, I enter the house, White light, white light splays out. The house sits atop its incline, the faint sound of a choir. Thank you so much to Jay, Donnie, and Adrian. I need to make two announcements. One thing I forgot to say is if you don't want to be filmed when you are reading, just let us know and we'll turn the camera off. And the second thing is, super important, if you buy an issue of Young West Tonight, Young West Tonight, you get a free slice of your uh, Lucky Slice pizza. <laughs> <laughs> right? nice. That makes it basically free. <laughs> essentially. It's essentially free. Yeah, it's $4. You may even be making something. <laughs> <laughs> The next three readers are uh, Teresa Dyer, Sean Anderson, and Ashley Thompson. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I have two things, and then I have one poem, and then I'll sit down. Um, <laughs> the first thing, Jennifer, I have it on very good authority that Riley Anderton would like to be added to the list. I know this sounds made up, but she said she wanted to be added. <laughs> yeah, she's real, she's there. I'm out of breath from walking. Um, the second thing is kind of a quick backstory. Uh, over last summer, last summer, Sean Anderson, who's reading next, um, went to Prague, and he got to go visit an ossuary, which is a, a place where they have collected human bones and they're displaying them as art or architecture. Um, and so he went, he wrote a poem, he bragged and flexed about it, and I was like, all right. So, um, <laughs> so then when I, uh, last fall, got to go also uh, to Europe, I went to uh, Paris, and there are some catacombs with an ossuary um, down in Paris as well. So uh, I was trying to flex to match Sean, and we'll see. I think he beat me, but, but I wanted to come out and support Nate and dig out huh, our ossuary poems. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> push by, push by. Mine, uh, the title is in French. <laughs> oh, that's already a point. She's already got a point. Le catacomb. <laughs> we try to make sense of our world, bury our dead. We try to make sense of death itself, inscribe rules for living. But nothing can make death more or less meaningful than it is. Not the careful categorization, the tests for sex and age, prevalence of disease, nor probable cause of death, not the plaque buildup on incisors, nor arithmetic to track arthritis propensities. Here beneath the streets and the sewers and the metro and the pipes of Paris, teams of researchers catalog, clean, carefully restack the bones built into their underground home hundreds of years ago. If human society from the medieval nights when these bones were first set to rest, through our present turmoil, have taught us nothing else, at least we must see our own innocent insignificance everywhere in these dark halls. Still, we must bury the dead, to protect them, to protect ourselves from them. And when, in the face of overcrowded cemeteries and contamination, a call is made to move the dead, we rebury them. We undertake the task because we must make sense of our lives and our deaths. We stack and pattern skulls into heart shapes suspended between countless femurs, arm and shin bones set to fortify walls, 
Millions, millions of bones support each other, walling each tunnel, aching with the stillness of architecture, reminding us of ourselves at every turn. Fuck if it isn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I also wrote an ossuary poem, and the thing is, when you live with Brittany Allen for a month, you end up writing poetry. I don't, I don't normally write poetry, but Brittany Allen, it's great. Um, mine does not have a good title, so sorry. I'm just not even. Mine is literally said like ossuary. That's the title. So hooray! Thanks. <laughs> um, ooh, and my phone Okay. Day before my 27th birthday, we descend into the underground chapel. We, the living, enter. Our laughter quelled by the keepers of the bones. We snap photos, staring into blank sockets of skulls. I'll send a photo home, trying to condense the weight of 60,000 bodies, mm. broken down into an image for my husband, mm. still asleep in our bed. A chandelier hangs central in the chapel, before Christ on the cross, built from the chosen dead, skeletons fragmented, reshaped to provide light. Mm. Every bone utilized, skulls hold candles, the chandelier crowned with the sacrum. I could not name who owned these skulls, could not tell what made them chosen, their bones all they left behind, and their children. Their stories passed on in blue eyes of the living, the amber wavy hair, flat noses, and long fingers. Passed down, passed on, the way humans pass on, make selves immortal. In their too short time they create life. Woman takes man between her thighs, creates man within her core. What happens when husband takes me between his hips without space to create? What will either man pass on? Aww. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I have two poems for you today because a bunch of my friends told me that I should yeah. read. Yeah. Yeah. So, I w so I pulled up very quickly um, a document on my phone that is called Writing Sample that I used when I was applying for grad schools a couple months ago. So I didn't really know what was on it, if I'm being honest. So here we go. <laughs> Food memory. Coke Zero hits different when drunk from a paper cup. Mm. Tastes like Disneyland, like sticky carbonation with no plastic bottle, no tin can, no straw between tongue and ice, because this is California in 2019, babe. We're saving the damn planet. <laughs> Coke Zero on tap tastes like saving the planet, like the way she kisses me under the pop of fireworks. Mm. I used to be a Pepsi girl, but now Coke Zero tastes like her lips, and I don't think I'll ever go back. Not after the tingle of aspartame in my fingertips clutching her hand in places where people can see us no coke zero tastes like her fingertips which tastes like the heat death of the universe yeah. or at least the death of this body mm -hmm. like when we die we will be gods watching the world bubble like carbon dioxide mm -hmm. or maybe in the end we'll just join the haunted mansion Happy <laughs> haunts, the memory of a coke in hand an eternal fast pass under the sickly fireworks oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And then just one more for you guys. This one is called Rays. For the bowhead whale that lives two centuries, the world changes so much in one lifetime. It started with a million different shades and wooden boats, and then there were a lot of McDonald's. Did you know a mantis shrimp can see as many as 16 more colors than humans can? I bet a mantis shrimp cried when the world began, clear as summer, and then Humanity sprouted up, a seedling toward the sun, and the grass is still green, the sky is still blue. No matter how small, no matter how messed up everything is, there will always be rays flapping their wings through the water mm -hmm. in aquariums, plastic houses like McDonald's. There will still be someone reaching in to touch their slimy hot dog bodies, and they will still smile through the glass. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm ranting about manta rays again, but listen, the ocean is sunlight <laughs> traveling one particle at a time through the darkness. How different are are they really space and the ocean, fluid, endless? I want to know every creature in their depths. I want to keep them as pets. I want to feel always like someone out there knows more than me, knows more than I do. Uh, 
knows more than I do. My insides move like waves beating up against some shore. I'm not sure of it yet, but I feel that I am becoming something. Mm. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for, to Teresa, Sean, Teresa, Sean, and Ashley. And now we're on to Shane. Still with us? Still Excellent. Uh, Kayleen, still with us? Kayleen, yes, good. And Metty, still with us. Okay, mm -hmm. welcome. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, hi, uh, I'm Shane. I'm going to read three quick little scribbles. And this is the first one of them. Um, it's called These Days. A laundromat afternoon, and no one is safe from my imaginings. Such fragile things. These sneaking tendrils of need painting strangers with a soft brush. Nerves aflame until our time's up. Please pardon, but might we discuss the task of turning me to us in moments past unmasking trust. I know it's fast, but fear we must. Amass these passions stacking up, our insides asking to combust. A past that's lacking proper touch, these forms in which our dust is stuck. A loneliness outlined as such, I'm much too much or not enough. The dryer dings, so I stand up mm. silently and exit. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. Um, so I came for, I just moved to Logan uh, like two months ago. I came to my first open mic last month. It was amazing. There are a lot of great people here. The energy is amazing. Um, and I read a piece uh, last month. This one is kind of a companion piece uh, written for that. It's called Interwoven. I have no luck with readjusting cells. My hands still take to flight unattended. Still race to let slip every casual adoration, every thousand word portrait of my pulse. I cannot unlearn a love of sunset or make one less wish for mountains. Cannot pretend my blood does not hum and song to body, chanting rapid oscillation. Sometimes these strange seeds take root and bloom in the dark, grow green through every part of you. How then to stop the tongue from talking, from tasting of petals? Maybe chance is only magic forgotten. Perhaps I'll always supplicate to beautiful coincidence. Mm -hmm. and the last one, um, a lot of these are written with a similar muse. Um, I, this is for my best friend. Um, it's called Optimism Bottle. <coughs> I want to write you something new, diaphanous and alluring, uniquely cerulean, to part my jaws and announce novel expression of synapses flickering and fire. But we both know how I'm wired. How damned has been my best luck. How these months have found me starstruck. A constant cartographer punch drunk on your heady sharing. Mm -hmm. So this is me again, simply and solemnly swearing. Shelter in sunlight, seeing and hearing. Yours sincerely, a former amateur magician with no tricks, no plans for disappearing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm Metty. Hi, this is my first time here. I want to reduce your expectations. No! <laughs> With Nate and everyone. I'm a software engineer, nice and writer, so I ask everyone's permission to read this. <laughs> and English is my fourth language, so sorry about that. <laughs> but I dare to write and dare to read. Yeah. Accept my permission. Yeah. That's good. So I want to read you the last, pe uh, last piece. I would call it prose, it's not poem. But so it's called, is the glass half empty or half full? Um, is the uh, conversation between two partners, uh, May and Sal, uh, and you will hear what's said. One should see the half full of the glass, May said. Although its mission was to shatter the invisible glass of silence between May and Sal, the statement thickened the air more dense than even Sal uh, even if Sal would have responded, his voice would have reached May's ear after a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Rays of light connecting Sal's eyes to the glass were so heavy, as if they were solid steel cords. Undoable it seemed, but Sal raised his gaze to May's face level after a duration that was hard for both of them to tell how long. Sal injected the air with a dose of reality by opening his mouth and responding calmly, yes, one should see the half full. 
but do you know what is in the glass? Mm -hmm. Mehu would not expect it to focus. Uh, uh, Mehu would not expect that the focus of conversation to drone by falling into the glass. Answered in surprise, water, I guess. <laughs> Sal, while lowering his gaze back to the glass, chuckled and said, "It is water with." Uh, it is water mixed with tears of my death angel. But do you know where the other half is? Sal even didn't let May process the heavy storm of the shock and leaving the reality of conversation to his catatonic gaze answered question briefly by saying, my belly. Uh, and I want to read one more piece. This was what, about uh, dying and this one is about killing. <laughs> don't, don't get scared. <laughs> it's called bullet, or I would say customized bullet. I want to buy a customized bullet that has just enough power to travel from the back of your head and pierce your forehead bone and falls right in front of you in the table that you are struggling to give birth to your thoughts. I want you to see, at least for a fraction of a second, the polished golden bullet in your table rolling on top of your scratch papers. I want to slow down the time for you that you, that you panic when the bullet enters your skull, opening its way in your soft brain. I want you to hear the crack of your skin being ripped in your forehead when bullet starts to depart your skull. I want you to be conscious of your slow consciousness loss. I want the panic brought you by the bullet to shock your heart that it sucks back all the blood from your face as if it's gonna be wasted. I want you to be paralyzed by the time that bullet has finished its journey making you incapable of seeing me since I don't plan any sort of distraction for you in this moment. I want you to be there fully experiencing the bullet. I want the surprise of your pain nerves in your body help to open the way for your pain nerves in the tunnel of the bullet to be processed with all the live neurons in your brain. But I don't want any fraction of second to be assumed or imagined by the reader. <coughs> After the bullet falls in your table, no blood, no mess. It's not fair neither to the significance of my pleasure nor to you that will miss that part of the story. Thank you to Shane, Colleen, and Metti. And we are last going to hear from Ronald Jensen and <coughs> Riley Anderton, who was, that's good? All right. <laughs> 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 Being a keeper about it. So, Ronald? Today and a calendar this year, but what do you do when you're just here? Will it be a day when you just have fun, or will it be a day when you get things done? <laughs> will it be a day when you're just dull, or will it be a day when you work on goals? Will it be a day when you start a fight, will it be a day when you do a start? Right after day and a calendar this year, but what do you do when you're just here? We got called Brennan. Brennan, I miss you. Can't believe you're gone. You got like a dims, and left where we are. And the code you told me, doctor smiled, and changed that code for more than just a while. Now, Stephen got faithfully, every day without fear, and left overlooked at you instead. You can use him up here to know what you have to say. Goodbye to you until we meet again in the next, next life, too. So Teresa, who volunteered me, left. So she had enough faith to volunteer me, but not enough faith to hear me read. So um, the poem I'm going to read tonight is kind of a silly poem, and I think that's okay. 
Um, sometimes I have a hard time falling asleep at night, and so I'll take online personality quizzes, um, <laughs> like BuzzFeed online personality quizzes, and they're really ridiculous if you've never taken them. It's like, tell me your favorite color, and I'll tell you the day you'll die. So they're really <laughs> just kind of like absurd, and so I wrote a poem about it. Um, so it's titled, BuzzFeed Knows Me Better Than I Know Myself. <laughs> um, I doubt my life would be complete if I never discovered what flavor of Pop-Tart I am. <laughs> Everything about me screams confetti cupcake. <laughs> I'm certain I should be a teacher or a doctor, but BuzzFeed knew in reality I was made for astronaut training. <laughs> One quiz promised my Taco Bell order would reveal the first time I smoked weed. The result? Not that far off. <laughs> Something I should really let the police know. Uh, BuzzFeed confirmed my lifelong suspicion my milkshakes bring zero boys to the <laughs> Thanks to BuzzFeed algorithms, I do know my soulmate is an Aries, was born in 1876, <laughs> starts with the letter J, so I'm pretty convinced Jack London was my soul. <laughs> I may have had an existential crisis when BuzzFeed psychoanalyzed where I sit on airplanes or the way I brush my teeth. I've had at least a dozen celebrity lovers, lived 87 past lives, and know every flavor of gum I should chew according to my zodiac <laughs> Every night, BuzzFeed gifts me a personal epiphany, only to have me scroll down and learn 97% of users got the exact same result I did. Yeah. <laughs> to Ron and to Riley for bringing this evening to a close. A huge thank you to Nate. Woo! Yeah! And thank you to all of you for coming out. Please support Young West. Get some free pizza. It's all good. Thank mm. you.